Seeing no introductions, it's therefore time for member statements. The member from Simcoe Gray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to talk again about the discrepancy between how hospices are funded in Ontario. <laughs> this is an issue I've been raising with this government for close to a decade, and it yet uh, is still an issue today. I wanted to begin by congratulating the staff and many volunteers of Matthews House Hospice in Alliston. I was pleased to participate in a funding announcement made by a member from Barrie last week, where the hospice received $1.2 million to go towards the construction of their new 10-bed facility. This hospice is also to receive operational funding for all 10 of their beds once open. While this is good news for Alliston, Hospice George and Triangle in Collingwood, who received no capital funding at all from the province for their 10-bed facility, only receives operational funding for six of their 10 beds. In fact, their four remaining beds are not allowed to be used and have sat idle for over a year. Hospice George and Triangle has submitted several proposals to fund these beds. They have asked the government to use the beds in collaboration with Collingwood General Marine Hospital to assist the hospital with capacity problems and flu outbreaks. They've asked to use the beds as respite beds, as they do in Sudbury. They've asked to use the beds if they fund them themselves, and again, no from the government. All of these requests have been turned down. Mr. Speaker, I find it unconscionable that four in-demand beds are sitting idle at the direction of the government, and I ask the Premier and the Minister to show some flexibility, fund these beds, and allow them to be put to good use. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you. I've been thinking a lot about this place, the Ontario Legislature. There's so much history here, and I still get that feeling of awe each time I walk up the front steps. But it is the people who make a place special. And in almost six years of serving the good people of Waterloo Region, I have come to know, respect, and in some in instances befriend the staff here at Queen's Park. Thank you to the clerks who have served this legislature so well. My caucus has a special relationship with the amazing restaurant and kitchen staff here. Yeah. The Q QP security contingent on any given day ranges from 30 to 45 security personnel, and they have kept us safe and have on several occasions intervened on our behalf. Sometimes they also have to spend hours listening to us, which, let's be honest, that can't be easy. It's not easy being Bruno or Jackie, the first female to serve as sergeant-at-arms. Thank you to the cleaning staff who take such pride in the work that they do in maintaining this majestic building, the media and the communications folks, the Hansard staff, the tour staff who highlight and share the story of QP with the public, and Jenny who delivers the mail each day. She always has a smile or a word of encouragement. The gift shop people love me because they help me every Christmas with my last minute. <laughs> they love me, I love them, and that's as it should be. And I will miss my colleague. And friend Cindy Forster, who has been my Queen's Park mom uh, for six years, and she's been Don't instrumental, <laughs> instrumental in taking me, talking me into running for this job, which I should dislike you for. <laughs> um, uh, but we've had great many adventures over the last six years. She's one of the best people I know. And she's an amazing public servant and politician. I thank her for the love and support over the years. And I know that Brian is going to be so happy to have yes. you back. After 40 years of public service, please, let's give a standing ovation to my friends. <laughs> Thank you. Further member statements. Member for Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise today to discuss the incredible athleticism in my riding of Beaches East York. A few weeks ago, the Ted Rees Midget Double A Thunder shut out the London Junior Knights, winning the Ontario Fe Hockey Federation Championship. And this year, our boys had an undefeated record of their division, going six games for six. This victory marks the first time in the, te the team has won a provincial title in their 54-year history, Speaker. But not only is hockey thriving, but five beachers recently were part of a synchronized skating team that won gold at the 2008 Skate Canada Synchronized Skating Championships in Oshawa. The team scored a total of 111.32 points over two performances at the event. They beat out 12 other teams with a routine based on the Hollywood hit, The Mask. Now, these teams would not be successful without the volunteers and the coaches whose time, energy and commitment to these sports have enabled them to succeed. As a hockey player, I understand the value of this guidance and the mentorship that these coaches provide. The value of sport to our community extends beyond the sport itself. It brings communities together. And there's nothing better than going to the rink to cheer a home team with a good group of friends. 
Even better, when the home team wins, Speaker. So again, I want to extend congratulations to Ted Reed, Midget AA Thunder, and Skate Canada. We will continue to cheer you on. Thank you. Thank you. Further members, famous member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, once again, I rise in this House to draw attention to the town of Halton Hills' long-term transportation needs. We continue to call upon the Minister of Transportation to partner with the town to develop a long-term transportation strategy for the town. Last fall, I worked with the mayor and staff of the town to initiate a private member's resolution, which was unanimously passed by this House. During debate, I spoke about the possible need for a Highway 7 Acton bypass, the issues surrounding the proposed commercial development of 340 Main Street Acton, the Halton Peel Boundary Area Transportation Study, which could lead to the construction of bypasses in Georgetown and Norville, a study which had been put on hold because of the GTA West Corridor study, the promised all-day two-way GO train service from Kitchener-Waterloo to Union Station with stops in Wellington Halton Hills, the town's role in the government's decision to widen the 401 from Milton to Mississauga, and the need for traffic signals near the Sands Condominium in Georgetown. We asked the Minister of Transportation to be a funding partner and support the town's vision of building and ensuring safe and efficient transportation opportunities for our residents and businesses. I had numerous conversations with the former minister, the Hon. Stephen Del Duca, and I believed we were making progress. Then a cabinet shuffle in January gave us a new Minister of Transportation. I know she is aware of these issues because I've talked to her too. I've always been willing to reach across party lines to get things done. We have less than a week until the writ is dropped. The Minister of Transportation still has time to do the right thing, but time is running out. The Minister lives in the riding of Cambridge. I would expect she travels through Halton Hills every time she goes back and forth to Toronto. There's a Town Council meeting scheduled for this coming Monday night. While the agenda has been set, I know that Town Council and staff would welcome the Minister of Transportation to come to our Civic Centre and make this announcement. All she has to do is say yes. One more time, I invite the Minister to visit our riding and to announce her ministry support as a funding partner for the Town of Halton Hills' long-term transportation strategy. Let's go. go Thank you. The member from Welland. And I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to use my um, last 90 seconds here to actually talk for people who still feel they have no voice, and those are the injured workers in this province. And I'm constantly amazed at the lengths that governments go to make announcements, only to find out that's not what it seemed. On September 1, 2017, it was announced that compensation awards for pain and suffering are now exempt and will not affect what you receive on ODSP. Yet, at, after several months of trying to determine if a non-economic loss or NAL award is included, we find out that it is not. 56-year-old Peter Hansen, from my riding of Welland, appealed four times to actually get his WSIB NAL award put in place. He finally won, only to have ODSP take away his $203.20 every month. Uh, a letter my office obtained from WSIB clearly states Mr. Hansen receives permanent disability benefits for life. But in the usual kind of double speak, this is not considered compensation for pain and suffering. Why not talk to Peter and find out about what is pain and suffering after several surgeries for an injured arm, metal plates and screws? A NEL award is defined as a permanent impairment as a result of a workplace injury or illness, but the government says that doesn't include pain and suffering. What desk-bound pencil pusher arrived at that decision? It makes no sense. So I asked this government in its last days to amend this ministry directive 5.1 include NEL awards as exempt from ODSP deductions for Mr. Hansen and the hundreds of other injured workers trying to survive in this province. Thank, Thank you. you. Further members statement the member from Guelph. Thank you, speaker and I in Excuse me. As is the want there is a, a point of order the member from Windsor to come see on a point of order. Point of order, Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to allow the member from Guelph to reintroduce her visitors in the gallery who weren't quite here when she introduced them the first time. I have to rule. The member is seeking unanimous consent to do reintroductions. Do we agree? Agree. The member may do her introductions, and then the clock will start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to introduce my husband, David. My, 
my son Richard and my grandson Malcolm. <laughs> and because he's not quite like the others, the executive director of OPSPA, Rusty Hicks, and then everybody else has at some point or another been on my staff here at Queen's Park. So I'm just trying to figure out who's actually here. Ashling McKnight, Chalini Nicolopoli, I always struggle <laughs> over getting this right, Colleen Hogan, Jason Pacelli, Kate Hammer, Terry Smuck, Lauren Tedesco, Lavin, Lavin's here, Hadisi, um, Megan Sammons is here now. Um, Mara Carruthers is somewhere down at the other end of the, <laughs> under the gallery there. Uh, Sam Andre, Alyssa Briarly, Jack Rubin, who's at the other end, uh, Ga Gabby Gallant, who just uh, appeared. <laughs> I think I got everybody, didn't I? Okay, so a wonderful group of people. Member from Guelph. So, as you all know, when the election comes around, I won't be running. I actually, I think somebody behind me here mentioned last week that I was having my 70th birthday, so I figured it was time to retire. But I want to start by thanking the voters of Guelph, who of course made all this possible for 30 years. And thank you to the two premiers that I have served under, Dalton McGinty and Kathleen Wynn. So Dalton first appointed me as Monty Quinter's PA at Community Safety and Correctional Services. I suspect because Guelph had, as you know, Speaker, uh, two jails had, that had recently closed before I became, the, uh, became elected. Little did I realize that it was going to take 15 years to even begin to figure out what to do with an historic retired jail. So the good news is that I think just this week, Treasury Board actually uh, dealt with uh, some of the paperwork so that that land, or at least the vacant part of the land, can go over to the city of Guelph and they can create the Guelph Innovation District. So some projects, if you stick to it long enough, <laughs> you actually get it done. And my next job was with Jared Phillips, where I first uh, got to join Treasury Board, which was sort of this wonderful master and the apprentice. So thank you to Jerry. Um, and of course, I stayed on Treasury Board in various capacities for a very long time. But what I wanted to say was what a oper wonderful opportunity that was to begin at Queen's Park with such pros as Monty and Jerry as role models, because both of them really taught me so much. Dalton also uh, appointed me. Sorry, I've got a call just to complicate things. <laughs> Dalton also appointed me to lead the Safe Schools Action Team, and that was later extended by uh, Premier Wynn when she was the Minister of Education. Our work led to anti-bullying legislation, the first in Canada. We also recommended revising the sex ed curriculum based on consultations which began in 2008, making this the most discussed curriculum revision ever, I think. So when Premier Wynne actually appointed me as Minister of Education, she asked me to finally get this curriculum implemented. Yeah. So it was actually, um, I was delighted to be able to take what we'd started at the Safe Schools Action Team and finally get the curriculum in place. And it's interesting to note that the original purpose, and still the purpose, of those curriculum re revisions were to help keep students safe, whether in their personal relationships or their internet relationships. So at Education, we created a new provincial collective bargaining scheme. People are up there in the gallery who have spent many sleepless nights in hotels 
uh, dealing with that. Um, and we totally revoked the Child Care Act, which had not had been updated since the early 90s. And then, of course, I became president of Treasury Board, a.k.a. Dr. No. <laughs> so where we were actually, <laughs> many people up in the gallery have helped me say no as well. So uh, great uh, uh, sort of end to that original pr apprenticeship uh, that I served under Jerry Phillips, who incidentally is still at Treasury Board as the world's longest serving unpaid intern, because Jerry actually is still an advisor to Treasury Board. So he's outlasted me even at Treasury Board. Uh, but the great news was we were able to balance this, uh, the budget that we just came out of. Uh, None of these achievements would be possible without the wonderful people in the gallery. And a special thank you to my family, who put up with me for 30 years. It's been a wonderful journey. Thank you all. I'm sure I speak for all of us when we say to the member from Guelph, thank you for your service to Ontario. Further member statements, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to mention that last night I was at a wonderful public tr transit town hall in my riding of Thornhill at the Thornhill Community Centre. It was organized by the South Central York Region Congestion Relief Committee, and the organizers were Fred Weingus, Ricardo Mashregi, and Jack Weinberg. We had representatives from lots of ratepayers associations, community groups, and individuals. Uh, Mayor of Markham, Frank Scarpitti, was there with uh, a lot of uh, interesting perspectives, and Alan Sheffman, uh, municipal local councillor in local councillor. Sorry, I'm seeing some motions. So, local councillor in uh, Thornhill for the city of Vaughan. Uh, the provincial uh, candidates for the upcoming election all got to give remarks and answer some questions as well about the Young Subway. And um, I just want to mention that uh, there's a two-fare wall still if you go across Steeles. I want everybody here to be aware that residents of York Region are stuck paying two fares, and that needs to be discussed. Uh, the Young Subway, the government likes to make announcements and re-announcements every election, but we, they've had 15 years. Nothing's been done. We were told by experts yesterday that $6 billion is needed. Coincidentally, Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General, backed up by the Financial Accountability Office, said that there's a $6 billion hole in this budget. So uh, it's disappointing, to say the least, that we're still hearing about preliminary design studies and not actually getting to work on building the Young Subway Extension. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statement, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I rise to speak about the great work of Durham College in my riding. A recent study highlighted that Durham College has an econ economic impact on the region of Durham of $913 million. And this significant impact, Speaker, is equal to roughly 5% of Durham region's total gross regional product and supports nearly 10,000 jobs. One out of every 24 jobs in the region, Speaker, is supported by the activities of Durham College and its students. The study was done by Economic Modeling Specialist International, who had this to say, Speaker, the value of Durham College influences both the lives of students and also the Durham region economy. The college serves a range of industries in the region and supplies local businesses with workers. Uh, speaker, the study demonstrates uh, once again that Beyond educating students, Durham College offers partnerships, corporate training services, and the applied research services benefiting the region's businesses and organizations. Speaker, I'm proud of the students, faculty, and staff at Durham College for their ongoing role they play in providing a high-quality post-secondary education to students and equipping them, equally important speaker, with the knowledge and skills to succeed within the region of Durham. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's therefore time for reports by committees. The member from Oxford. Thank you very much.